back to the place I know With the mystery shack and the forest gnomes I'm already back, so come on, let's go Don't get me started, my heart's in gravity falls Welcome to Mystery Shack Look Back, a nostalgic time capsule and no-spoiler book club of the original Gravity Falls fandom. We are your curators. I'm Ella. I'm Charlie. Ella, I like to think of, of our podcast network, Pipe Dream Podcasts, as a little bit of a family of sorts. I think Michael and David are our podcast daddies. Um... <laughs> Yeah, I think we'll have to, we'll work, we'll workshop it. And, uh, hello, we actually have with us today our podcast, Uncle Tony. <gasps> oh, Uncle Tony. Hello, Tony. Goldmark? Hello, I, I wasn't sure if I had been described into existence yet at that point. I I, I, I think I'm kind of half here now. Oh, I, oh uh, keep, keep describing him, keep describing him. He, he doesn't fully exist yet. I can't feel my legs, oh my god. Tony, you have lived essentially four lives as a content creator. Yeah, I'm, uh, I, you just can't get rid of me, can you? You reviewed theme park rides for, well, some websites. For my own purposes, basically. I was, but I, I, I did spend a few years on a certain website that that we will not mention, but uh, I had a web series called Some Jerk with a Camera for, for many years uh, where I just talked about theme parks and uh, and did comedy videos about them, and they're all still archived on my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Tony Goldmark. And now, of course, you're, you're uh, the main reason that you are on this podcast. Uh, what are you doing nowadays? I am doing a podcast of my own called Escape from Vault Disney, and yeah, it's basically a, uh, a weekly podcast about Disney Plus and the various forms of content you will find therein. And uh, also... Worth mentioning and not really related to anything. You went viral for putting every scene in the Marvel Cinematic Universe in chronological <laughs> order. Oh yeah, I saw that and literally uh, was terrified. Um, so I just have I b before we get into the Gravity Falls stuff, I just want to know why. <laughs> I think I was just really bored during the pandemic. So I put my podcast on hiatus. Up to that point, I was recording every episode in person, mm. and I hadn't realized yet that it's just as good, maybe arguably even better if you record over Zoom. I I, I just thought, eh, the chemistry won't be there. And it turns out I was wrong. I, when I started doing the show again via Zoom, it turned out just fine. Yeah. But I thought... You know, I'm I'm just going to put my show on hiatus for a while, and I just needed something to do to fill out the day. So I thought, you know what? I'll just rewatch the whole Marvel Cinematic Universe. But I just watched all the movies, and I was like, yeah, what if I what if I put this in chronological order? Like, you know, just to fill out the day. And I posted it, and I didn't think anyone would care about it, and it went viral to my <laughs> great delight and shock. You recently returned to recording... Escape from Walt Disney in person. I just listened to your soup, soup, super monk, super robot monkey team hyperforce go episode. Yeah, uh, that that that's the most recent one to be released publicly as of the date we're recording. I'm not sure when this episode is going to come out. Wednesday, August 18th. Okay, August 18th. Well, um, that so this is coming out on my birthday. That's cool. Oh, oh happy birthday, oh, Tony! My goodness. Uh, Everyone happy. say happy birthday yeah. to Tony. Okay, ready, ready, ready? We can sing it now. We can sing it now. It's public oh, domain. Oh, uh, not over Zoom, but okay, I'll try. Happy, happy birthday, birthday to you. So in the Super Monkey something, 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 go episode. <laughs> Super Robot Monkey Team Hyperforce Go, Charlie. God. Super Monkey Robot Team Hyperforce Go. Close enough! In that episode, you and Dave, a.k.a. Doggins, display a wealth of knowledge about the career of Alex Hirsch. Yeah, we, we got on a bit of a tangent at one point. How did you get into Gravity Falls? The moment when I was like, okay, I'm in love with this show, I will watch every episode from now on, was the moment in the pilot where the gnomes took off their human costume. Yes! Yup, same for me, same, same for, for us. Yes! <laughs> Yeah, we have a whole we make a whole point in our in our tourist trapped episode. And you can very much see the Simpsons influence. Oh, yes. yep, yep, yep. First time, certainly the first time a Disney show really even came close to and, and, and really for the most part captured what made classic Simpsons work. Captured the captured the tone of it. To the point that the previous episode uh we've 
we talked about is basically one to one uh Lisa the Iconoclast. Yeah, a rational treasure where they find out that the town founder was a fraud. Right, right, right. right, right. Springfield, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but no, it's 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 yeah, it's all over the the show. And and this episode has parallels to the Simpsons movie where Homer fell in love with a pig and in this one Mabel falls in love with a pig. Well, that's as good a, a segue as any. What episode are we talking about, Ella? <laughs> when we are talking about the first non-Brazilian person to travel through time. (laughs) I'm the first non-Brazilian person to travel backwards through time. Correction, Homer. You're the second. That's right, Mr. Peabody. Quiet, you. Talking about the time traveler's pig, this is the ninth episode of the first season of Gravity Falls. It premiered on August 24th, 2012 on the Disney Channel. Friday. Step right up and dunk me, folks. It's a special, all-new Gravity Falls. I'm talking to you, cutoffs. Come to the Mystery Shack Fair. The mission is proceeding as planned. For a simple... Oh, my gosh, a pig! Ow! My eye! Carnival. Hey, watch where you're going, man. But is it? You two! Are you from the future or something? Uh, Are you following us around? Identities will finally be revealed. Everything is different now. All new Gravity Falls. Is this making any sense to you? Friday at 9.30, 8.30 Central. Part of Night of Premieres on Disney Channel. So we just watched The Time Traveler's Pig. Yeah. Tony, was that a Disney Plus or a Disney Minus? Uh, In Gravity Falls' entire 40-episode run, I don't think there's a single Disney Minus among them. Fair enough. I think every last episode of this show is a very solid Disney Plus. Just spoilers in case we ever cover Gravity Falls on my show. But uh, but yeah, this show is just amazing. Every episode is so wonderfully well written. It's it, it has such a great comic sensibility behind it. It's got such intriguing sci-fi premises behind it, which sometimes are kind of abandoned for the sake of the joke, but that's okay because they're really good jokes. So... I just I just love Gravity Falls so much. It's it's one of my favorite shows ever. But uh the guest star in this episode is Justin Roiland, who as we've discussed before, Alex Hirsch was obsessed with in college. He was obsessed with him in college. They ended up working together on Fish Hooks, which is a I think a very underrated, it's not quite the level of Gravity Falls, but it's a pretty good underrated show, uh, which was on Disney Channel for a while in the early 2010s and is now on Disney Plus. And, uh, and, and of course, Justin Roiland now is, uh, universe renowned as the creator of Rick and Morty and multiverse. And yeah, m- multiverse renowned, absolutely. I mean, it's funny that you mentioned the, um, the Simpsons Halloween, uh, toaster time traveling episode. Because that was co-written by Dan McGrath, who was also the story editor. Yeah, in the credits, they call him story editor. In the commentaries, they call him the head writer for season one. The design of Blendon Blandon was based off the head writer of Gravity Falls first season, Dan McGrath, who also wrote for The Simpsons for a couple years back in the 90s during its golden era. The joke of Blendon Blandon, the reason you, you cast Justin Roiland and you make him look like the fat and bald Dan McGrath is that time travel is more responsibility than any person should have. And in every time travel fiction, it's mishandled. But they just thought it would be funny if there was just a complete loser that's given this godly power. (laughs) Which, by the way, I I, I didn't piece it together until now, but that was kind of later ripped off in Milo Murphy's Law it, with... Uh, yeah, Cavendish and Dakota. Cavendish and Dakota, yeah. I f- forgot their names for a moment. But yeah, they were kind of the losers at their time travel agency. I, yeah, noticed- I think they try to have a little more dignity. <laughs> Time travel agencies are becoming more and more of a thing in fiction, I've noticed, between Milo Murphy's Law and, of course, now the TVA in Loki, so... But, uh, this is not the TVA, this is the TPAS, the Time Paradox Avoidance Enforcement Squadron. Legally distinct. <laughs> uh, yes, yeah, so the, the reason that time travel even comes into the fold is that the Mystery Shack is holding a mystery fair, a carnival that Grunkle Stan, uh as made sure is 100% rigged, <laughs> um, which is fantastic. I love, I love, I forgot about it, that he's in a dunk tank that is titled Dunkle the Grunkle, which is fabulous. <laughs> and and Dipper, uh, in 
noticeable growth from his arc in uh, the episode Double Dipper, he just dove in and just asked Wendy right out the gate if she wanted to hang out at the mystery fair, and she said yeah. And so they're hanging out, and uh, then they they encounter, well, he and Mabel encounter uh, this time traveler. Yeah, and uh, and... And the, the the time traveler, Blend and Blend, and of course, like we said, is voiced by Justin Roiland. And I would describe it, the voice kind of goes all over the place, but for the most part, I would describe it as grown up Morty. Like, like, like it's basically Morty's mannerisms in, 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 in vocals, but with less of a child inflection. It's got kind of that half British accent that George Lucas directs everyone to have, where he he kind of <laughs> pronounces vowels like this. Um, kinda, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a, a great performance, even though, yeah, there there is some consistency issues, because the very first line he says in the episode sounds like Rick. The mission is proceeding as planned. Over. And then the rest of the episode, he sounds like Morty. But, but I don't see any anomalies. I don't know if it's some kind of paradox, or if I'm just really tired. But we're finally meeting. This is the mysterious Goggles Man. That appears in the background of the first... Three episodes, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes, we brought him up in Headhunters that people had been theorizing, does this does this mean anything? And and here we go, confirmation, it does. This is like our first taste of a mystery that spans multiple episodes that gets answered in a satisfying way, which is kind of huge if you're like, we talked about it, we're, we're, we're retraining our brains as cartoon viewers to watch a show where there is continuity that matters. And I think to have an, a mystery that, that actually gets paid off like within a season is a good precedent to set when you're like, does any of this actually matter? Are they thinking about any of this? And they are. They go so far as to even include um, in over the credits, you see how he went back into the previous episodes and it all ties together. Jason Ritter, was, uh, who voices Dipper, was only treating this show as like a day job. He would go in, he would record the lines, he would get paid. Maybe he would leave it on in the background for younger relatives and not really pay super attention to it because he's already read the teleplay. But uh, someone pointed out to him that Blendon shows up in the first three episodes and he was like, what? No, he doesn't. <laughs> and he went back and watched... And just start, became a mega fan of the show he was on <laughs> and started when he would show up to records being like, so, uh, Alex, uh, about that author. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. At those journals. Hey, buddy. <laughs> yeah, but he was he was strung along just like all the right, viewers right. were, which is fantastic. So there is a, a story that during this episode, Alex printed out a frame, handed it to Jason and said, within this frame is the biggest secret in gravity falls and uh, and even even on a micro level like the the whole notion of uh you know in this episode th- this episode is notable for the very first appearance of waddles as well yeah uh, waddles. waddles shows up in the theme song mm-hmm. um but it's not a character in the show until this episode it is and it's wild i didn't even it's so hard to remember that <laughs> that he's not in Like, the first half of season one. Yeah. But it was very much the intention of Alex Hirsch wanting to make this a show where stuff changed from episode to episode. Like, on the one hand, it is a very cartoony show where you could tell a weird joke and just kind of write it off as, ah, it's cartoon logic, which this episode does a lot. But at the same time, it was a show where the characters would grow and evolve. And in this episode, Mabel gets a pet pig. And in the next episode after this, she still has her pet pig. and, And Waddle's is is just there for the rest of the series like you know sometimes sometimes the simpsons have a dog sometimes they have a cat sometimes they have a cat and a dog sometimes they have neither Uh, speaking of the simpsons alex hirsch's main influence on flexing continuity in a cartoon is futurama and sure enough nibbler yep gets acquired around the same amount of episodes in Mm -hmm. and uh also has a background cameo in the first episode alluding to a greater mystery right 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 So Waddles uh, is based on Alex Hirsch's real-life sister, Ariel Hirsch's childhood love of uh, pigs and and pig toys. She had what Alex describes as a shrine. She would probably call a display because she's not as mean to herself as he seems to be in some of these (laughs) interviews. (laughs) It had gotten to a point where still to this day, right now Ariel Hirsch is a marriage therapist but um, still from older relatives gets pig plushies as birthday presents. So like some kids, you know, you hear about horse girls. This was a pig girl. (laughs) 
<laughs> and this when this <laughs> show came out, um, Ariel was kind of over the whole pig thing because she was right. in her 20s and still getting gifts based on what she was interested in in elementary school and middle school. And then uh, at the time ran a Tumblr where she would interact with Gravity Falls fans and they kept asking her, so Waddles was created as a present to you. How much do you love him? <laughs> and I remember following that Tumblr and she was so excited about Waddles. I wonder how much of that was performative for the sake of the fans and how much of her was actually just like, I don't want to think about pigs anymore. Oh, yeah. I hope I hope it was... You know, I hope she didn't feel that that pressure. Yeah, I, I hope she liked being, you know, real life yeah. Mabel because I'm, I, I mean, we all know, you know, because some people there's there's varying levels of it. Like, remember that guy who was the real life inspiration of Kramer mm-hmm. on Seinfeld, and he had that whole like like New York bus tour. But I think you know, real life aside, Waddles is perfect for Mabel. Um, he's you know, it's not a traditionally adorable oh, animal disagree I guess, disagree no you're right no it i mean it's an objectively adorable animal but i'm saying traditionally well in real life in real life pigs are all over the place sometimes they're cute sometimes they're really really not waddles is the mo- oh i'm sorry uh, my my ride's here no you called oh, some oh, pigs oh. not cute so now they're coming the to pigs get are coming the pigs are coming to get Oh, you. God. The pigs, literally. <laughs> but Waddles in particular is the most adorable cartoon piggy in the history of mm-hmm. the cosmos. I think we can all agree. Like, there's never, there has never been a cuter pig. He's introduced with one of my favorite jokes where... <laughs> if you can guess the critter's weight, you can take the critter home. Sir, I must have that pig. Ah, oh, 15 poundy. So, how much you guess anyways? Um, 15 pounds? Are you some kind of witch? Uh, The name Waddles actually comes from a real-life pet pig of the co-writer of this episode, Ari Wallington. Yeah, I remember it was like a Reddit AMA or something where she was like, yeah, we... (laughs) Every year at 4-H, we would raise a pig, name it Waddles, and cook and eat Waddles. Oh, uh, no. <laughs> It is also worth pointing out that both Alex and Ariel were at the exact demographic to watch Babe when it was in theaters. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, hence the, hence the last line. That'll do, pig. <laughs> That'll do. That'll do, pig. That'll do. Nothing like a kid's show referencing a line that the the kids watching weren't even born yet when it came out. But. Well, no, because I, me, uh, not really realizing what it was a reference to at the time I watched it in 2012 was like, oh, <laughs> nice Shrek reference. <laughs> <laughs> That'll do, donkey. That'll do. Also, the story function Waddle serves, the character function, Mabel loves so hard and every summer romance she has is weirded out by her intensity. Right. So giving her something that is able to love back at the extent that she loves is something that makes it less depressing to watch Mabel, honestly. Yes, Mm -hmm. yes. Well, although I should say the audience doesn't want to see Mabel sad. I guess we get we do get some of the most of that in this episode, though. And if you look to your left, you'll see miserable Mabel, the girl who went bonkers after her dreams were shattered by some heartless jerk. Oh, hey, Dipper. Pretty much, yeah. So uh, before we get too into the time travel of it all, I wanted, uh, uh, Tony, I wanted to ask you, so as we said, you you have covered a lot of theme park content. Uh, Could we briefly have a state of the parks about the mystery fair? (laughs) What is Grunkle's, how, how, how is Grunkle Stan's? Uh, amusement park doing in your opinion uh it would it would be charitable to call it an amusement park (laughs) and the show acknowledges that it acknowledges that he quote spared every expense yes and then dipper breaks his bones falling out of the the sky tram to which i say as a disneyland fan quit your bitch at least you still have a skyway (laughs) and it only lasts for one day when the episode begins, it seems like they're just setting everything up. Mm-hmm. Later on in the episode, it flashes forward to the next day and the fair's already, you know, defunct and, and they're tearing everything down. It's a whole defunct land. Pretty much, yeah, yes. Yeah, so now, the, now Kevin Perger is like, we're, today we're talking about the mystery fair, the ill-fated <laughs> Stan, P- Stan Pines' ill-fated uh, amusement park in the back of his 
tourist trap. It's a pretty good Kevin Bergerella. <laughs> Friend of my show. So yeah, uh, it's um, it's bad. It's a it's a it's a really bad like like sub county fair level amusement park, and uh, and I think that's the whole point. That's the whole joke is that it's it's not a good it's not a good park. It's not a good fair. A lot of the times they are limited by being in summer like we said with the last event at the mystery shack was basically their way of writing a school dance however this absolutely brings back memories of of county fairs in the summer for oh, me oh yes <laughs> oh well for sure when dipper ends up uh losing the the ball toss he's trying to impress wendy with and then actually robbie ends up going out with her he kind of enters the state of depression and there's a lot of these slow atmospheric shots of the mystery fair and I'm like, mm, aesthetic. People designing the look of this show got kind of bored that everything had to be summer and will find any excuse to show off any other colors. Uh, so we got a brief glimpse at the mystery shack in the winter in this episode. Yes, as as they time travel and Dipper tries to fix his, his mistake, they end up... Uh, Traveling all across the timeline. We see what what appears to be a younger Stan, although we have some interesting fan theories later to talk about about that. Speaking of mysteries, this is our second appearance of the ice bag that is on the, the mysterious wheel of symbols uh, in the intro. Mm. This is a more <laughs> specific ice bag, actually, because it has a little tear in, in the corner of the bag that appears on the wheel. Much to think about. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, as well as... In the previous episode, Irrational Treasure, the long document describing the Trembly cover-up, mentions that there is a time-traveling baby frozen in a glacier that we will never see because glaciers can't melt. Right. Uh, so we're totally fine. But in this episode, we learn we weren't totally fine, Ella and Tony. That's right, because we travel uh, way forward into the future to, to find a bunch of... Uh, futuristic uh, laser guys fighting off a giant right. uh, time baby who is who is destroying everything. First appearance of time baby, I do believe, in this episode. <laughs> yep, that is true. But, you know, not the first mention, oddly enough. No, no. And one thing that I just love about um, the future characters, we get two more time travelers named Lolf and Lolf Dungren. Lolf and Dungren, yep. <laughs> Alex told storyboarder Eric Fountain to draw them like Dolph Lundgren from Time Cop. Dolph Lundgren isn't in Time Cop. That's Jean-Claude Van Damme, so I don't think Alex can tell the leads of Universal Soldier apart. <laughs> well, who can? Because I think, isn't it like conceptually they're they're more like the Time Cops, but in look they're yeah, yeah. Universal so Soldiers? They're, it's, it's a combination of the Time Cop outfit and the Universal Soldier outfit because they had no idea what Alex meant. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, Tony, did you grow up with the Oregon Trail? I did not. I was not much of a gamer when I was a kid, nor am I much of a gamer now. Uh, so I didn't even know the Oregon Trail game was a thing until years later. But, um, but I understand that the Oregon Trail sequence in this episode has references to it. Yeah, I, I was born in 93, so I was at the tail end of of Oregon Trail being required curriculum in some schools. <laughs> yeah, which is fascinating to me. It's a game everyone remembers fondly because it was the time that their school said, now you have to play right. a video game. And they were like, what? Mm -hmm. what? Okay. It's and it not... was a little too good to be true, maybe. I don't know. Do you enjoy Oregon Trail? It's not a great game, but I do prefer, I will say I prefer it to math class. Uh... <laughs> sure, 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 sure. Uh, yeah, so... <laughs> We have someone trying to sell dysentery as if it is a liquid. Well, yeah, swirling it around in a canteen, like kind of waving it around. Which, yeah, uh, I, I have since played Oregon Trail because uh, I have so many friends that are like, wait, you've never played Oregon Trail that are the same age as me? Mm -hmm. No, my, my school was up to date in their computer class. We had math blasters. We had Mavis Beacon. Ah, fancy. But uh, I love Fertilia. The most fertility is a fantastic joke. I don't know how they got away with that, <laughs> with, with calling the the uh, mother of six kids Fertilia. and and the <laughs> very Simpsony more little hands to render the tallow. <laughs> like just any time they make an old timey joke, it feels very Simpsons. <laughs> we get to see Dipper be a traditional nerd for kind of the first time because in order to calculate how to win this baseball toss for Wendy, 
he ends up just doing a bunch of math on uh, on some yeah, glass. Yeah, I, I have... If we were taking this show seriously, which we're not really, because at the end of the day, it is just a cartoon, but... Um, the It's real! It's real! <laughs> but the idea of the ball hitting her... Hitting Wendy's eye every damn time, no matter how Dipper tries to change it, like, like that is just inevitable except for the timeline where mabel doesn't win waddles it's like yeah it's a time curve pretty, i mean it's pretty convoluted when you really break it down i mean we accept it because it's a cartoon but that's and i think it's it's acceptable because it leads to a good conflict i think you can suspend disbelief but, this but is the, yeah it's the kind of conceit you could only get away with in a cartoon i don't think any live oh, action sure. show would be able to pull that off yeah for uh, sure and and you know, cause, 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 you know, time travel leads to questions and, you know, like, like Blendon goes back to investigate time anomalies, which didn't exist until he went back and Dipper and Mabel stole his tape measure and caused the time anomalies. Mm-hmm. And they just write it off with Mabel saying, ooh, my brain hurts. Like, yeah, well, no, they take the end game approach, which is don't worry about it. Exactly. Exactly. Don't worry about it. Repeat to yourself. It's just a show. You should really just relax. End game makes sense in retrospect now that yeah, we know yeah. that someone is scrubbing out things that don't match with how the timeline is supposed to go yeah well no that's what yeah that's what we said while we were watching is the dipper losing the tosses on the sacred timeline yes yeah, and, and, and you know time travel has been done so many times in fiction that it's hard to find new fresh takes on it especially when it comes to the hardware of like what what is the time vehicle wait wait a minute blendon are you telling me that you you put a time machine into a tape measure why not do it in you know style it's stylish right Tape measures. Uh. I don't think the tape measure had ever been done before before this episode. I, I it's a cool idea. Yeah, yeah, it, it is. It really it 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 plays into it, and it allows you to control how far you travel back in time. So that's so that's really cool. Su- I, I I also want to briefly point out Seuss eating the sandwich backwards. <laughs> it's it's pretty unnerving, but it would have been ten times as unnerving in live action. If you've ever oh, yeah. if you've ever seen footage of someone eating played backwards, it's just the creepiest yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, I wonder if the animators had to reference it's, that. It's, it's just the creepiest yeah yeah, excuse me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah yeah. I think the the rules of the time travel, like I said before, it's good that they don't get as uh into it as right. You know, because like you said, it raises a lot of questions, but I think they make a smart choice of not answering them in favor of telling a good exactly. story, which it is. Look, that's between that's between Time Baby, Dolph, Lundgren, <laughs> and Blendon. Dipper and Mabel, not their problem. You mean Lolf and Dungren and Blendon. Did I say Dolph and Lundgren? <laughs> yes. <laughs> you accidentally got it right. Well, Dolph Lundgren is presumably a consultant in the in the time and Between Jean-Claude and Van Damme. Or, yeah. or, or, Va- Von... Dodd. <laughs> and just keep going. It's worth it. <laughs> Wait, nope. Lost it. Hold up. Help me here. Nope. You're on your own, my dude. You're <laughs> Vaughn Dodd and Jan Clam. There. We got it. Originally, the shot of Mabel and Waddle's lady in the tramping the pizza slice yeah. was, was going to be them lady in the tramping a hot dog. Uh-huh. But then. But then Alex Hirsch realized, wait a minute, a pig eating a hot dog is kind of messed up. So they changed it to a pizza slice, but Alex Hirsch but Alex Hirsch didn't realize until it was too late that it was a pepperoni pizza slice. Yeah, so. yeah. Because that's like the stock cartoon pizza slice. It has pepperoni on it. <laughs> exactly, yeah. So it, it it's still pretty messed up. Uh, well, so I googled what pepperoni is, and apparently it is a mixture of beef and pork like but pork is still part of the mixture so it's still mm. unless they just got lucky and got a pure beef pepperoni Maybe. if they're mixing it if they're if they're using both there's yeah. a chance it, it's actually probably a better chance of the hot dog being non-cannibalistic because there are all beef all beef hot dogs yeah that's true dad that all comes from the same animal for <laughs> sure lisa a magical oh, animal, animal. <laughs> wait, wait 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 lisa honey are you saying you're never going to eat any animal again? What about bacon? No. Ham? No. Pork chop? Dad, those all come from the same animal. <laughs> yeah, right, Lisa. A wonderful, magical animal. And also, <laughs> uh, in the alt, I-, I guess Mabel's too distraught to think of it, 
But her in the alternate timeline where Pacifica wins Waddles, uh, Mabel squanders the opportunity to use the same sick burn against Pacifica that Pacifica had used against her. Like, like it, it, she'd have to slightly change the wording, but she could have said, Pacifica, I didn't know you had a twin too, or something like yeah, that. Yeah, I feel like she's not, she, Dipper is the one who considers revenge to be right. worthwhile. Yeah, that's I true. think Mabel, Mabel. No, Mabel loves Pacifica. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I love that Pacifica is showing up at all of the, the Mystery Shack's events, like giving money to Grunkle Stan. She's so small. She's so petty. She's <laughs> Yeah, but she is a member of high society and she's deliberately going to the to the Mystery Shack just to like make fun of people and feel better than them. Maybe maybe uh her father is like, now Pacifica, you must you must show off that you are important by appearing at all town events. That's true, yeah. In this episode, there are a lot of mysteries coming to a head or, or just peeking their head out the door. So, we're going to talk about them in a segment slash hallway we call the Hall of Conspiracies. Ladies and gentlemen, right this way to the Hall of Conspiracies! <laughs> It's more today. It's more like the hallway in Scooby Doo, where every door kind of, you know, we're running around and and we're peeking around stuff, and stuff peeks out. Yeah, yeah. So uh, this one comes to us from gravityfallsconspiracies.tumblr.com. It says Mabel is the epicenter of all the mysterious happenings in Gravity Falls. She was the independent variable in order for Dipper to impress Wendy and the time traveler pig. She was targeted by gnomes and Lil Kidian, and is mostly responsible for the twins' shenanigans in Gravity Falls. Mabel will probably play the greatest role and be crucial for figuring out who wrote the journals and what the greater conspiracies in the town... are. Are? We don't have R on here. Well, that's a conspiracy in itself. Where did R go? I like this theory because Mabel's the best character, so... It just makes sense. Mabel, Mabel took the R. <laughs> she's got all the R's. And she's not giving it back. This one comes to us from the TV Tropes Wild Mass Guessing page. Uh, once, uh, uh, Tony, I'm going to tee it up for you. Uh-huh. Uh, so this, this theory states that Old Man McGucket is even older than he looks. Why would that be? The baby with the Band-Aid on his chin in the Oregon Trail sequence uh, is baby Old Man McGucket. Because it because the band aid on the chin and then McGucket's got the band aid on his beard in the same spot, yeah. It just it just never healed, just never healed in 150 years. Well, that's a strong band aid. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm stuck on band aid brand because band aid stuck on me. When were band aids invented? Um, well, it's just a it's just um gauze and uh, surgical tape sold together. I guess that's true. Yeah, band aids were invented in 1920 for what it's worth, which is. Even more interesting. The brand, but yeah, gauze and surgical tape, I mean, that, they were part of bloodletting, so. Yeah, I guess so. Yes, there is one from Gravity Falls Conspiracies Tumblr. What's fascinating here, and I think I know why, they don't believe that the figure that pops out of the door in the winter se- sequence is Grunkle Stan. And I think what they're paying attention to is we have seen Grunkle Stan without the fez, correct? Yeah, well, we see, yes, we've seen Stan in a fishing hat. What I know, though, is that Stan has straight hair, and the Stan that pops out of the door at the Mystery Shack has curly hair, which leads some people to believe that this is future Dipper. That was not a trip to the past. That was a trip to the future. And I definitely see that, because, yeah, that is, uh, even though Stan has gone gray, so his hair is, uh, and would be thinner, that is not his hair. Uh, it, well, it, well, it's bold of them to assume we'll still have snow in the future. <laughs> <laughs> no! <laughs> well, no, they're, yeah, they're traveling forward to summer. Right. Adding on to the future Dipper theory, uh, the Gravity Falls subreddits, unfortunately, the, the member was deleted, so we don't know who it was, mentions that the journal page in the intro says that Stan is not what he seems, so maybe he was future Dipper all along. So that's going even further to say that Maybe there there isn't really a Grunkle Stan. Hmm. That that actually, because Grunkle Stan is voiced by Alex Hirsch, and Dipper is v- based on a younger Alex Hirsch, and Grunkle Stan is Alex Hirsch doing an old man voice. So now we have another tidbit from Reddit, which is that in July 2012, there was a Reddit account made with the username Blendin Blandin, 
And this user made two comments on Gravity Falls related threads long before anyone knew Blendon's name. There, there's a post that they made on the Gravity Falls subreddit uh, where they are, I, I think, talking about the cameos in those first three episodes. Yeah, yeah. It's the, the Reddit user Blendon Blandon responded to the bald guy in the background of the first three episodes, which we now know to be Blendon Blandon, saying, Oh, you guys, stop it! It's probably just a mistake! <laughs> yes, and then on the GIFs subreddit, somebody posted a GIF of Dipper uh, from The Inconveniencing, just as a relatable GIF. And Blendon Blandon coming completely out of the woodwork to ask, Has anyone here seen a calculator? Which is referencing the fact that that's one of the time anomalies that he's picking up. And no one knows for sure who this was to this day. It was probably a crew member. But the fact that this appeared on the internet before anyone could have known that his name is Blendon Blandon is fascinating to me. Wow. Yeah, that must have been a crew member. I, I, there's no, maybe it was Alex. Maybe it was Alex Hirsch just, just screwing with the fans. <laughs> yeah, I think there, there's, there's speculation that maybe this was supposed to, this was planned to be like a bigger ARG sort of thing that didn't really take off, but, uh, I, I love it. I love unsolved, the unsolved mysteries of unsolved it, it, mysteries. It seems like such a thing Alex Hirsch would do. It just, yes. It's just his type of humor of just, yeah. Yeah, so he hasn't, <laughs> that that user has not posted since those two posts. Because um, he got eaten by the time baby. Yeah, well, I mean, he got mashed up first. The time baby, it's not safe for the time baby to eat things that aren't. You're right, you're right. Yeah, they put, uh, they, he got mashed up, put in a spoon, and then the time adult, well, here comes the airplane! <laughs> Here comes the time plane. <laughs> what is what is the cryptogram in this episode, Charlie? It's not HG Wells approved. Ooh. Hmm. Good one. <laughs> Tony, it was fantastic having oh, you on this my show. Pleasure. I loved this so much. Thank you for no coming problem. on no and problem. talking about talking about some of the same uh on brand stuff for Pipe Dream, I think. Uh it's nothing too out of the <laughs> wheelhouse for for the members of this podcast network. We would love to have you back at some point oh, if you are interested. I would love interested. to come back. Thank you so much. And, uh, and please, let's plug. Yeah, I have a podcast, like I said, called Escape from Vault Disney, in which me and a rotating series of guests, including uh, including the hosts of The Weird Alphabet, and uh, who've been on both together and separately, um, w- uh, me and a rotating series of guests review movies, TV shows, and short films available on Disney+. Plus chosen completely at random. Every week, our almighty randomizer chooses something on Disney Plus for us to watch and review, and each week we slavishly obey for your amusement. Yes, it's a gra- I highly recommend the show. It's, it's nice and versatile, so if, like, if you're not into one episode, the fact that they are randomized means that the other ones will have a different flavor. If you just listen to this episode, please go on Twitter and wish Tony a, a, a happy birthday. And also, while you're there, you could follow our show's Twitter at Mystery Shack Pod. Yeah. I've recently done episodes on D2 The Mighty Ducks and the 1994 Fantastic Four animated series. So go check that out, which should be on pipe dream podcast and wherever else podcasts are available that is such a wild coincidence because if you want to find more episodes of this podcast you also would go to our host network pipedreampodcast.com and you can find even more shows like how did this not get made come on for google pods and of course escape from vault disney <laughs> and while you're there you can find links to our show's social medias and discord server you can also contact us at mysteryshacklookback at gmail.com if you have experiences in the Gravity Falls fandom back in the day that you want to share with us to contribute to our time capsule museum <laughs> in audio form. <laughs> Thanks to Pry and Brian for making the instrumental for our theme song and for voicing Stan in the Hall of Conspiracies intro. Thanks to Sim and the Dim Bulb V2-0 for making the instrumental of the Hall of Conspiracies intro. And thanks to Tony Goldmark, the birthday boy, for taking time out of his day to appear on our podcast. <laughs> Thank you, Tony. Woo-hoo! This was really, really cool. And you are a fantastic guest. And and I also want to say, uh, I also have a Patreon, which you can, uh, where you can support my stuff. Go on a Patreon, Tony Gold, patreon.com slash Tony Goldmark. You can check out my archive of, of videos back when I created videos. Gross. At youtube.com slash Tony Goldmark. 
And you can follow me on Twitter at Tony Goldmark. So. All right. Well, this was so awesome. Thank you again. No problem. This was such a good time time, you guys. Time to time, time, time. I I time love you, time guys. <laughs> I time love you too, time Ella. If you want to be happy, I will be waiting. Time after time. I, I was watching some of the Some Jerk with a Camera videos and thinking how unfunny and cringy it would be if we got Michael and David to record cameos where they yelled at us for doing our podcasts wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what it is. It, it, it was like that That almost became a cliche after a while that you'd record a cameo of someone more famous than you just yelling at you for doing your show wrong. I don't know if we just all craved conformity or what. <laughs> this means if the randomizer ever lands on an episode of Gravity Falls, you have to have Ella and I do a brief pre-recorded cameo where we go, Hey, I was gonna review that! <laughs>